So, I'd just like to introduce myself a little more. Number one, I'm no longer with Cornell. I, I had a courtesy appointment. I, so I really uh, stepped down from my position from Cornell when I was uh, 50 years old, actually. I had invented some things that gave me the freedom to actually step away from the university. And actually coming out of the university was one of the most liberating things I can have, that, experience, that I ever experienced. There is an oppressive spirit over the universities and uh, it's very intimidating for Christians, generally speaking, from my experience. So um, after that, I had a courtesy appointment with Cornell. A uh, courtesy appointment means you don't have to work and they don't have to pay you. And so that actually was really valuable because I've been able to publish many scientific papers in scientific journals with the Cornell uh, affiliation. Uh, so um, the department discontinued that courtesy position um, two years ago, and so that does make it much harder for me to publish. So um, anyway, but um, I'm grateful for the time that I was able to publish as a Cornell professor. Um, I would just like to let you know that I have been held almost all possible points of view on origins. And therefore, I am uniquely qualified to say that I'm usually wrong. So I don't actually look to you. To, I don't want you to look to me as an authority. I, this is something I've studied in depth, but, you're, but I'd really like to emphasize that our authority is God and that human authority never transcends God's authority. So if I say anything that's off, just look at scriptures and you can tell me what I, where I'm wrong. And, but really, one of my, I, I love soundbite, you know, mottos, things that say a lot with a few words. And here's a good, a good message. Uh, believe God more, believe man less. I love that motto. Uh, and so uh, it really after I've been doing Christian apologetics, science-based Christian apologetics for 20 years, and uh, it always keeps coming back to that, is uh, within the church and, and, and church versus uh, unchurched people. So it always comes down to human authority and God's authority. And basically, the church, the, in the New Testament, we're just, the church is described as the believer's. And we are believers first and foremost. And because we believe in God, we do not exalt or bow down to human authority. We respect people's expertise, but God transcends whatever man would uh, want to contest. Okay, so one of the things that, um, here's another sound bite that I like, good science affirms scripture. That's based upon 20 years of experience. And my colleague uh, who's um, worked with me on the Adam and Eve question, uh, he, he and I have kind of been developing our, our uh, ministries in parallel. And uh, he and I both would say that every time we really delve into a deep scientific issue that has bearing on the Bible, uh, in the end, the secular or the evolutionary perspective fails and uh, the biblical and scripture is affirmed. So I, our experience for 20 years has been that good science affirms scripture. So here's Rob Carter and he's, uh, he and I have been working on this issue for 15 years. Uh, very important issue, but actually all the pieces to the puzzle haven't come together until the last year or two. So we're finally ready to write a book called Adam, Eve, and Evidence. And so Rob has been uh, is an important uh, colleague for me. And uh, there are other people who've contributed to this effort who are shown also here also. So team of scientists. So there are some resources that are, might be of use to you would include Adam, Eve, and Evidence, The Descent of Man. That's the book that I don't have yet for you, but we're trying to finish writing it. Uh, the second one is Adam, Eve, and Evidence. If you go to logosra.org, that site has um, this article and many other really interesting articles where we've delved deeply into specific issues and then written technical papers that can be 
uh, read on that site. And uh, actually, Blue Letter Bible lets us post our, our, um, our articles on their website. So uh, the third one is In Light of Genetics, Adam, Eve, and the Creation Fall. And again, that was originally published in a Christian apologetics journal, but, um, but you can access this at the same uh, website, which is logosra.org. So there's a places if you want to dig deeper. Um, and so a lot of people would say, well, let's not talk about Genesis or origins or even the Old Testament. Let's just focus on the good news. And what I'd like to suggest is that um, the beginning of things, the, those the early chapters in the Bible, are actually not the gospel truth, but they are foundations for the gospel truth. Because one of the big things that are happening, that's happening in the culture today, is more and more people is saying, sin is a bad word, don't use that word. There's no such thing as sin. People are inherently good, and we just have to get along. Well, if there's no such thing as sin and there was no fall, then why did Jesus have to go to the cross? This is foundational. Uh, if there wasn't uh, a fall, then the cross would be unnecessary. Okay, so there's a lot at stake. Um, so this is... Um, this is really important in my, to my own heart and I think for all of us, is God good? There have been times as a Christian where I wondered if God was good. And those were dark days. And God redeemed me out of that funk that I was in. And, I, and, I, and so actually foundational to my faith in God is that he is good. Deep down, always completely good. And so, um, amen? Are you, are you there? <laughs> amen. So, so the question becomes, if God, so oh, by the way, did I tell you that I was an atheist and then a theistic evolutionist and then an old earth creationist and then a young earth creationist? I don't know where you are on that. And I, well, I love you, whether you're old earth or young earth or anything like that. But... Um, I just want to give you kind of information of where I'm coming from. Um, when I was an evolutionist, I believed, and a Christian, I believed that God did it through creation. And uh, the problem with that for me was that that means that God is the author of death, not the defeater of death. He created death, and death is essential for evolution. Death of the unfit is the flip side of survival of the fittest. And so unless there's been billions of years of just enormous amounts of death and suffering, then we have to attribute... You see, when you're a theistic evolutionist, I was 10 years a theistic evolutionist, partly because God was working on me with other parts of my life, and partly because I didn't know what to do with evolution. I hadn't heard that there was scientific evidence that could... Could, uh, that would be any... Uh, there, I didn't know of any alternative point of view. So, um, if you... When I was a theistic evolutionist, I did believe God was the author of death, evil, and suffering, and that he made parasites. The parasites that hurt us now were already there before... long before Jesus. And so... Um, It's really discordant with the character of God to attribute evil to God. But there, it, there's no place for Satan or the fall in a theistic evolutionary framework. So, uh, in fact, where do you, you know, in the time, in evolutionary timeline, where do you put Satan? Where, where do you put the fall? So really, there, most theistic evolutionists would say the fall is some sort of abstraction. It's not a literal event. Um, but if it's not a real event, then it, it bears on the question of goodness of God. Um, secondly, um, if, if for the people who reject a literal Adam and Eve, um, 
it really means if, if you don't believe the early chapters of the Bible, which are foundational, then you really don't have a basis for believing the rest of the Bible. And it's kind of a slippery slope. When I, I, I often would catch, my, catch myself sliding down. Well, since there was no literal fall, then maybe this miracle is a little bit, maybe that's also just an abstraction of some sort or a parable or, or a myth. And so uh, belief starts to corrode if you start by, be, by disbelieving the first chapters of the Bible. And so is, is scripture trustworthy? Here's another question is, um, did God just write the Bible for the ancient people? Or did he write it for us? I think clearly he wrote it for all people. It's his revelation to all of us. So he could have easily to told us uh, that he created by morphing one kind into another, but he doesn't. In fact, he is very explicit that each kind reproduces unto its own kind. And so God is, doesn't even mention, there's no trace of evolution in the Bible. No trace. So why would God do it through evolution and never tell us, even when science supposedly was proving evolution? But it doesn't, it's not there. And so is God a liar? This becomes the issue. Is, did he hide from us the actual way he created? The third is our own character. Are we special or are we just animals that evolved? Are we clever monkeys? So um, this is huge for our personal identity, and it's huge in terms of uh, how, what, what our morality is like. If we're just animals, then for example, why should we restrain our sexual behaviors? Um, and that's what the culture is happening today, is because of evolution, it gives license to do whatever we want because all our instincts come from God. God built into us through evolution, sexual aggression and all these other things. So there's a lot at stake. Um, really, what this, one of the things that's at stake is the cross. Like I mentioned before, uh, Jesus died to rescue us from the consequences of the fall. And so lastly, um, what's at stake is heaven the nature of heaven. If there was not a, a literal creation, a miraculous creation, a paradise of Eden, and a time where there wasn't death or suffering or sin, then one has to start to rethink heaven. And one has to ask the question, maybe heaven is also some type of abstraction. And maybe it's not literally going to be, we will be in incorruptible bodies, and that we will live forever in the presence of God and free from sin. It is, it may be, is that just an allegory for a, a dressing up this world and fixing it up and a new coat of paint? And so really, the heaven is... Heaven... So here's, here's the thing. Is the first chapters of the, of the Bible are about creation and a heavenly state and the presence of the tree of life. And the last few chapters of the Bible describe heaven restored and better, and where there's the tree of life and their bookends. It's the, it's the beginning and end of the Bible. We need to embrace them because they're both very important. It tells us how things began and how things end. And so when we don't accept miraculous uh, beginnings, it's hard to accept miraculous finish. And so these are the issues that are terribly important. Um, there are three types of evidence that affirm a literal Adam and Eve. They are scripture, history, and genetics. And so let's just look at scripture briefly. Um, the, New Testament, uh, the New Testament authors extend, extensively quote Genesis as, as if it was history. Jesus speaks of Genesis as history especially the first 11 chapters of the Bible. Um, specifically, the New Testament authors speak of the fall, the serpent, Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, Seth, Enoch, the flood, and Noah. And so these are not um, mythological personalities. 
the, the, the new, Jesus understood them as people who lived at the beginning. So specifically, Jesus addresses the flood in Noah. He says, as my return will be as in the days of Noah. Uh, and it speaks, it speaks specifically of the flood and the ark. And so, uh, so Jesus clearly believed in that, the whole flood issue. Um, there's twice as many references to Adam and Eve in the New Testament than in the Old Testament. And so, um, the new, the, you know, there's a lot of verses. We can make a great Bible study just to go through all the New Testament verses. But, we, but, but it's just good to know they're there. Uh, historical evidence. Um, historically, who has believed in a literal Adam? Um, I've, I've heard people make the claim, well, the ancient Jewish people did not actually believe in a literal Adam and Eve. It was all allegory. Uh, and the, the Jews at the, and that even the early patriarchs of the church didn't believe, was, they didn't believe in a literal Adam and Eve. And um, even the great evangelists didn't necessarily believe in a literal Adam and Eve. Well, that's just not honest. Basically, it's very clear from historical records that Adam and Eve were foundational uh, beginning with the ancient Israelites. Uh, and um, so the ancient Jews and many modern Orthodox Jews uh, still believe in uh, a literal Adam and Eve. The authors of the New Testament, including Jesus, clearly believed in literal Adam and Eve. The early church fathers, there are many, many letters from the church fathers, and they often speak of Adam and Eve. The Catholic Church and the popes, the uh, I have a good friend who's a, who's a historian for the church, the Catholic Church. He says in every single uh, official proclamation and in every single papal pope, uh, proclamation by the pope, um, the church has always affirmed that Adam was made from dust and Eve was made from Adam. That's his, that's, it just runs throughout. And, and maybe that's going to change in the Catholic Church in the near future. But for the last uh, few thousand, one to 2,000 years, that's clearly been the Catholic position doctrine, not just a position, but a, a firmly committed uh, truth. The Protestant church, starting with Luther and Calvin, they openly speak of the fall and uh, Adam and Eve. The great evangelists clearly speak of Adam and Eve, not as abstractions or myths, but as history. And so most of today's Bible-believing Christians, what fraction, I'm not sure, but I think a large part of all the Christians on this planet believe in a literal Adam and Eve still. Imagine them being so stupid as that. That's the way the world says it. I, that's not me speaking. But the world says uh, only a, a tiny group of wacko right-wing Christians uh, believe in a literal Adam and Eve. That is not true. Um, and so uh, most of the Bible, most Bible-believing Christians clearly understand Adam and Eve as history. About two billion people in the world are claimed to be Christian. And so maybe half of those people would be believing in Adam and Eve at least. But here's the surprise. Muhammad and the Muslims also believe in literal Adam and Eve. And they represent another two billion people. So we may have half of humanity believing in Adam and Eve. And then today, uh, so like I say here, maybe half of humanity and that, and that through history, this has been widely acknowledged. Um, so the history is telling us that um, that's, that has been, that a huge part of humanity has always been worshiping, or not worshiping, acknowledging the literal Adam and Eve. So here's, um, in, the, in the Bible, as we look at scripture, there are genealogies. I'm, I'm going to talk about genealogies for a second. Um, the biblical genealogies... I was supposed to say click every time, wasn't I? But he can read my mind. <laughs> See, I can't click from here. But he just is totally, he can read my mind. That's awesome. The same thing happened this morning. So, uh, so it's really interesting to, I used to look at the, the genealogies in the Bible as nonsense. I said, this is fluff. People living to be 900 years, 
Obviously, this is either a myth or someone's just having a good joke here, and I would just brush, breathe through that. But, but as, as you study the genealogies more, they're more and more coherent. And so uh, the genealogies are, occur in Genesis 2, Genesis 1 through 11, in, in chron- First Chronicles, and in, uh, and in Luke 3 of the New Testament. And they're remarkably coherent. Uh, obviously, Adam was the first generation, uh, but then Adam to Abraham is recorded. Abraham was the 21st generation after Adam. And this is, makes sense. You see, as you go through the Bible, you would expect you, it's a historical, most of the Bible is historical, a, a linear historical progression. So you'd expect the genealogies to get longer as the time goes longer. So Adam is first Abraham's the 21st generation. David is the 31st generation. So in Chronicles, it lists from Adam to David. And it says, here are the names of all the people in between. And, and then lastly, in Luke 3, um, it says that uh, from Adam to Jesus was 77 generations. And those, those, gen- those four genealogies all line up appropriately. Uh, this, the Luke passage has what looks like a... Um, Transcriptional error. There's two, two uh, canons where there should only be one. So it's discordant with the others. And that, but that's, we all know that there are transcriptional errors in the versions of the Bible we have. And so, um, so the genealogies are coherent. The, the, especially for Christians, the Luke genealogy should be especially important because it goes... Jesus was the son of, was the son of, was the son of, was the son of, was the son of. Uh, so now we're down to um, Seth was the son of Adam, who was the son of God. That's the genealogy. Adam didn't have a father, earthly father. And the genealogy uh, is, is uh, compelling. Now, you could say, well, genealogies don't matter. Genealogies were incredibly important to the ancient people. People had memorized their genealogies. And of course, as time passes, it gets longer, you have more generations. But um, for example, coming out of Babylon, uh, as people came back to Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile, the priests had to prove their genealogy that they were from descendants of Aaron or they couldn't be made priests. So everyone was keeping track of their genealogies, and I trust uh, Jesus, the mother of Mary. Jesus, the mother of Mary. That's not the right thing to say. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. By the way, as I get older, I flip words sometimes. My, my wife knows that. <laughs> so Mary, the mother of Jesus, would have known her genealogy, and she would have informed Luke of that. So... Um, there are other genealogies that are really interesting. Um, do you know that there are, are many Europeans today who, who have genealogies that go back to Adam and Eve? Is that crazy or what? So um, there, are, there are hundreds or thousands of people in Europe who have genealogies that go back to Charlemagne and other medieval kings. And all the medieval kings had genealogies that went back to Adam. So that's really interesting, you, but you think, well, maybe that's, that's kind of weird that Europeans, maybe all those, everybody was lying, all the medieval kings were lying. The modern Arabs are also really interesting because in Saudi Arabia, it, they still have a tribal structure and the tribes, each tribe has its own genealogy and all their genealogies converge upon Ishmael. You know, the Bible suggests that uh, Ishmael, when he separated uh, went into Saudi Arabia, and lo and behold, the Saudi Arabians record the same thing in their genealogies, and they all converge on Ishmael, and from Ishmael they all go back to Adam and Eve. And the Quran speaks of Adam and Eve. And so the modern Arabs uh, somehow have genealogies that go back, ancient genealogies that go back to Ishmael and Adam and Eve. That's just radical. I mean, so God is given us all these incredible evidences. They just pop out of nowhere. 
You go, really? Saudi Arabians all have genealogies that go back to Adam? Um, let's move on to genetics. That's the main topic. That's my speciality. And uh, turns out it, there are more than one or two evidences. There are numerous evidences, genetic evidence, for a literal Adam and Eve. So here they are, seven genetic evidence supporting a little Adam and Eve. We're going to go through these quickly. I'm really glad no one's sleeping, though. I noticed that no one's gone to sleep. So that's encouraging for me. Um, mitochondrial Eve, Y chromosome Adam, population bottleneck, design variants from the, the are, go back to Adam and Eve, the Babylonian dispersion, which is how the, you know, humanity uh, diverged into the different types of uh, um, language groups and cultures. And then the ape to man problems, the fact that you can't get from ape to man through mutation and selection. And then lastly, genetic entropy, things are going degrading so they can't be evolving from ape to man. So let's begin with evidence number one, mitochondrial Eve. How many people have heard of mitochondrial Eve? Okay, you see, you're a smart crowd. Now, mitochondrial Eve was um, discovered by evolutionists several decades ago. And when we started to learn how to sequence DNA, uh, they started to, the, the simplest thing to sequence is this little tiny chromosome, the mitochondrial chromosome. And so they started to take D, uh, D, the mitochondrial DNA from all kinds of people all over the world to see what their sequence was. And as they studied all these mitochondrial sequence, they discovered that um, they were all practically identical. And um, they were stunned because in deep time, you expect uh, everyone to be very divergent from each other. And so um, they discovered that there was a basically a single woman who gave rise to all the mitochondrial chromosomes on the planet. And they, tongue in cheek, they said, we'll call her mitochondrial Eve. And they have regretted that since then. Because more and more, the person who gave us all our mitochondrial <coughs> chromosome um, was the mother of us all. And she is a very reasonable, she's very reasonably the biblical Eve. And we have, we can approximate what her sequence is. So now, was she a real person? She left behind uh, her fingerprint upon the human race. Um, Eve's mitochondrial DNA consensus sequence. So back in 2007, when Rob and I were first starting to collaborate on the Adam and Eve issue, we published a paper uh, in a mainstream journal on uh, mitochondrial Eve. And there's two things you'll know. This is called Mitochondrial Diversity Within Modern Human Populations. The journal uh, said we had originally the sequence of Mitochondrial Eve. They said, we don't like that title, so please choose a different title. So we were a little more subtle in what we were saying. We didn't want to make biblical claims in this paper. Uh, and then you'll notice my name isn't on it. And we decided my name would be death to the paper. It wouldn't get published. So uh, Rob's Carter is the is the is the pay, is the author shown um, so what we what rob mostly this is rob's work um, uh, together we planned it and ex, and he executed it and then we wrote it together um, so we we were able to get from uh, archives dna archives the mitochondrial sequence of 800 people from around the world and then we were able to align all those sequences to see where they differed from each other. And then we, we could calculate what's called the consensus sequence. So um, consensus sequence means, um, let me think, think of it this way. You have a, a bunch of people, and they all are identical, except certain people have a mutation here that's in no one else. Well, those mutations are obviously not in the original sequence. So you can erase, you can basically pull out the mutations and find the original sequence. It's, and so it's the consensus sequence because it's the, it's the sequence that's most similar to everybody in the, in the pool of data. So we did this research and um, 
To make it visually clearer, we developed what we called a divergence diagram. So in the center is the mitochondrial Eve consensus sequence. And uh, so she lived in the past, so she's a different color. And the blue are people alive today who contributed their DNA to this research. And so what you see is everyone's diverging from the center, which is what you expect. Mutations accumulate over time. And so the more time, the more divergent everybody is from the original. And so, uh, so number one, we know, we can, we know pretty, pretty closely what her Eve's sequence was. Number two, we know how much people have diverged, which tells us how long ago Eve lived. Because we know the mutation rates, so we can figure out um, just how long, the, the, the longer the time is, the more the divergence, the more distance between a, a, any given person and the, and the Eve sequence. So what did we find out? We found out that on average, uh, there are only 21 accumulated mutations in this small chromosome. So um, the, the sequence is 16,500. So very few mutations separated uh, the average person from the original consensus sequence. And we, the mutation rate is approximately, for this one chromosome, is a tenth of a mutation per generation. So if you just do the math, that means that there's been about 210 generations since Eve. And uh, that's, how, how many generations from Adam to now? From Adam to Jesus, which says is 77 generations. And we know that from Jesus to now is 2,000 years. And that's, um, and you can just multiply the generations by um, 25 years. And well, the bottom line is about 170 generations from Adam to the present. So, it's, so Adam and Eve were not very long ago. And so that, and what are, are, we get the number 210 generations from our study. So we, using the Bible as a basis, we, we can confidently say that less than 200 generations from Adam to the present. And our actual observation is we estimate that it's been about 210 generations from the Eve sequence to modern people. That's pretty amazing. Um, so if you multiply 210 generations by 25 years, because there's about 25 years in per generation, you come up with, Ad, with Eve living a, a little more than 5,000 years ago. Very biblical. Like we'd be really happy with 25,000 years ago because these, these numbers are, have a huge margin of error. And so to get this number is, was astounding for us. Um, so now let's move on. What about the Y chromosome? What about Adam? We've just seen that there's amazing evidence for literal Eve. What about Adam? So Google Y chromosome Adam, and you will find out that um, evolutionists decades ago were started sequencing the Y chromosome from lots of people around the planet, and um, they found that all men are pretty much the same. And so the, all men's Y chromosomes are almost exactly the same sequence. So all Y chromosomes come from one man. That's the evolutionist saying that. And um, we can approximate his sequence by consensus, the consensus approach. And um, we see very little variation, which means Adam was recent. And here's the divergence plot. So the, the rings are different size. These are 200 mutations uh, each ring. And so uh, we see the, the consensus sequence is the red dot in the middle. And you can see that males, as they accumulate mutations, diverge more and more from the consensus sequence. And so um, what it tells us is um, for the evolutionary dating methods, so they use a da different dating method. And it's flawed because they, um, they actually m uh, mess with the, the, the mutation rate. We can measure mutation rates now. 
So there's the observed mutation rate, and then there's the evolutionary theoretical mutation rate, which gives them the numbers they want, gives them the times they want. But basically, if you look it up in Wik uh, Wikipedia, let's say, uh, it says that Adam, Y chromosome Adam, that's by, by the way, they call him Y chromosome Adam. They didn't learn the first time, so then now they have to deal with Y chromosome Adam. And uh, so they're saying, well, we think 57,000 years ago to 340,000 years ago was when Y chromosome Adam lived. Um, on average, there are about 300 new mutations compared to the original sequence. And um, the mutation rate is about one mutation per generation for that chromosome. Different chromosomes are different sizes, so they have different mutation rates. So how long does it take to get 300 mutations? It takes about 300 generations because there's one mutation. So multiply by 25 to change it to years, and we get 7,500 years since uh, Y chromosome Adam. Well, gee, that's a big problem because there's 1,000 years between Adam and Eve, but the margin of error is like plus or minus 10,000 years. So um, what we find is that Y chromosome atom is real. It's true that all men get their Y chromosome from one man. We agree with the evolutionists on that. We think uh, using the actual mutation rate rather than the theoretical mutation rate gives us incredibly biblical numbers. And so that's like, wow. Um, so you'll hear people say, oh, you can't, they're, you know, you're being deceived because there's this thing called coalescence which will give you a common ancestor no matter what. Um, and so this is uh, their evolutionary escape mechanism, but it doesn't really work for two reasons. One is, um, here's what they picture, is the top line of little people are the people who lived at the time of Adam and Eve or let's say just talk about Eve for now. So there's a population of men and women in Eve's generation because they all evolved from apes. That's part of the assumption. Um, but only the middle woman passed on ancestors. All the others, their lineages died out, went extinct. So there were lots of people back then, but most lineages failed and therefore it looks like there was only one woman at that time. That's the coalescence model. It, um, th two things to note. Number one, their assumption that those blocks of extinct lineages, the things in the red boxes, they have no evidence for that. They're just imposing that on their model because they need, they can't have a beginning with two people. So they say there were people, but it's, there's no evidence for those people it's just that they are determined to believe that. Number two, these type of coalescence studies assume random mating. Uh, basically, um, if people divide up into tribes and nations, uh, the whole calculation fails. So, um, so that their, their escape mechanism doesn't work. It makes them feel better, but it doesn't work. Um, evidence number three is initial population size is very small. Um, am I taking too long? Is this, we have, we're still going, we, okay, hang in there. I'm st so um, the evolutionists discovered that there was a time in human history where the human population shrank down to a very small number and almost went extinct. Is there a biblical parallel to that? Um, first of all, evolution requires a consistently large, diverse population. Number two, uh, they were already complaining that men... So, so the issue is, if there was always a sizable population of people, then uh, man should have be more diverse. There should be much more diversity in man. Uh, and we are quite a homogeneous group. Like we're 99.9% .9 identical to each other. So they say there's not enough homogeneity. Um, and so they say there must have been an evolutionary bottleneck when the population shrank down to almost nothing, nearly went extinct, and then recovered, and the population grew again. Well, there's no evidence for that, but it's, but it's a nice theory, and it helps explain why there might be um, a, a, a bottleneck. 
but there's no evidence for it. It's just an assumption because otherwise their model fails. Uh, but as a better explanation in the Bible, the Bible says we started out with a very small population. In fact, just two people. So, uh, so the, uh, an initial small population isn't a problem for us or a bottleneck. And then the two people grew to be a large population and then there was a flood and only peop eight people survived. So there was a bottleneck in the Bible. So the evolutionary bottleneck has been a mantra that I've been hearing for a couple of decades. But really, it, the, the Bible has a better explanation. And um, so, so the Bible predicts that there should have been uh, a small population initially and then a serious bottleneck. And the evolutionists uh, came to learn, figure that out much later. But um, we think the biblical model is more realistic. Okay, so the evidence number four, design diversity in Eden. We were just saying uh, that a small population might have small amount of diversity. Now, the, there's a group called BioLogos, which is um, a group of theistic evolutionists who are convinced that we evolved from apes and a group of people who insist there was no, li since we evolved from apes, there was no literal Adam and Eve. And they've been very militant about that. There's some evidence that they're softening that position, but they've been very militant that there is no Adam and Eve, it's just uh, some type of abstraction, and, uh, and therefore there was no fall. So it's like really messed up theology. But um, they say, there's too much diversity in mankind to be explained by just two people. You, you notice that we were just, they were just saying there's too little diversity, now they're saying there's too much diversity uh, because two people couldn't give rise to lots of diversity. Well, they're ignoring the idea that Adam and Eve might have been pre-programmed to have diversity. So Adam has two sets of chromosomes and Eve has two sets of chromosomes. By the way, Adam, Eve is not a clone of Adam. That doesn't work, right? Because there'd be two males then. So don't think of Eve as a clone of Adam. She was taken from his, from his side, but then God would have given her her own genome. So the, the, there's four sets of chromosomes. Four sets? Four sets of chromosomes. <laughs> and and um, there's only four letters in the, uh, in the genetic alphabet. And so there's any amount of diversity that you could program into those four sets in Eden. And so there's almost unlimited diversity that God could have created in the first two people. And so that's really interesting. Um, they didn't even think about that. They just had this idea. Um, they, they put this out here as a major challenge against Adam and Eve without having thought it through. That's disturbing. Um, so just take any two people are there any married couples here? Well, Helen and I count. Will you raise your hand? Okay, so any one of, any one of the couples in this room, if they, gave, if they played the role of Adam and Eve, like everybody else disappeared, those two people um, carry seven to eight million genetic variants between them. So in any two couple can produce vast amounts of variation. But if you have a designed Adam and Eve, they can have much more variation because he could design it into them. And none of it would be mutational variations. It would all be good variation. So the idea of programmed uh, variants is that they're, they're designed. So people are, there's different types of beauty in this room, different shades of brown, different um, curly versus straight hair. God um, gave us gifts and talents. And so those are, Gifts and talents don't arise by mutations, which are typographical errors in the genome. Gifts and talents were programmed into Adam and Eve. As you try to think about Adam and Eve as the first couple, sinless, and bearing all of humanity's future good variation, including all human gifts and talents, you start to realize, oh, this wasn't like some caveman person. These weren't a caveman couple. These were human beings beyond what we could imagine today. And so that's a, and the, the, if that's attractive to you, the idea that people could be like that, know that you will be given an incorruptible body to which will be yours for all eternity. 
And so even if you're old like me, it's okay <laughs> because I'm looking forward to heaven. So Adam and Eve could have had much more genetic variation. And so um, all that diversity would be instantly available if you believe in a miraculous creation. Not a problem. Um, I'm going to I'm going to keep going because I sometimes get a little too much into the detail. The bottom line is, um, because of the biologos argument, first they said there's too much diversity, and then when we responded, hey, it could have been design diversity. They went to another level of argumentation. It's a little more sophisticated, but it has to do with the pattern of that diversity. Was the diversity that we see, could it be attributed to just evolutionary process or could, uh, and so it's, it's a technical paper, but we published, we spent three to four years scrutinizing this issue. And f for the longest time, we could not um, reconcile it. And then we finally saw our error and we were able to respond to their, um, their, uh, their kind of accusation uh, in terms of attacking Adam and Eve with a technical paper, uh, which really falsifies their thesis. And this graph, some of you like graphs, some of you don't, but the black line represents the actually observed pattern of genetic diversity with rare variants being on the far left and uh, abundant variations being on the far right. And so the black line is, is what we see. The blue line is what you get if you do numerical simulations. That's a technical word, but there's a technology to see how things play out in, in, virtu in a virtual environment uh, that is biologically realistic. So um, the blue line is the evolutionary scenario. Uh, and our Adam, we have ran several Adam and Eve scenarios. And they all matched up really well with what's actually seen, much better than the evolutionary model. And so we showed, because they were insisting that uh, I, actually, one of the people who in BioLogos I was talking to, I, I said, we can, we, we're, we're going to, we, our preliminary results show that we can resolve this. And he said, no, there's no way you can resolve this. And so we published this work, and he ended up saying, I guess you were right. So, so the arguments that are put out are often sound so authoritative, but until you scrutinize them, you, you shouldn't just, ob, just automatically accept an argument against a fundamental biblical truth. It's the bottom line. Tower of Babel. Uh, you know, humanity is diverse now. And we have all these different cultures and all these different people groups and all these different languages. And um, here's Stephen Jay Gould, very famous evolutionist. And he's uh, publishing this in the National Academy of Science, one of the top journals in the world. Uh, and he's talking about the Tower of Babel. He says, the Tower of Babel may emerge as a strikingly accurate metaphor. You know it's metaphor, but strikingly accurate. We probably did once speak the same language and we did diversify into incomprehension as we spread over the face of the earth. He's basically saying yes to the Tower of Babel. Um, the Tower of Babel is amazing. And basically uh, there's more and more evidence that we didn't come out of Africa we came out of the Middle East, which is biblical. So here's um, a map from National Geographic, and they're reporting on evolutionary studies. They're looking at the mitochondrial chromosome, and they're tracking basically where different mutations have gone. Because, you know, uh, people in the same people group uh, will tend to share the same similar mutations. And so they were able to track it. Basically, if you look at the map, you can see that um, there's, there's not some place out in the desert where there's a little flag that says man began here. But what you do see is that the basic trend is that it's out of the Middle East and into the other continents. That's very biblical. That's what, would, what you'd expect from the, the Bible, what you'd see in chapter 11 of Genesis, 10 and 11. So again, the science more and more affirms scripture if you're willing to look at the evidence with, uh, without an evolutionary bias. And by the way, I have bias. Everyone has bias. The honest scientist says, yes, I have a bias, and I try to account for that. And I, I put it out there in the open because it does 
our presupp presuppositions really do color how we see things. So all scientists who are honest say, yeah, we need a double blind for this experiment because I really want this experiment to turn this way. And I, so don't tell me which one's which. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Um, racial differences. This is one of, the, one of the popular things people say. How could you get the different races from two people? Well, you have to understand that there is no such thing as race. And uh, basically, there are people groups and language groups. But there's only one race, the human race. And that if Adam and Eve were designed to have genes for brown skin and genes for, for dark brown skin and genes for light brown skin, that's not a problem for creation. And uh, Adam and Eve could have in, had any number of children. They lived, he'd lived, Adam lived to be 900 and 30. That's quite a long time to be a daddy. So uh, you'd have lots of dad babies running around. If they were designed with both alleles for, for dark brown, light brown, you'd get all shades of brown in the first generation. This is not like rocket science. And so even now you can find couples with their medium brown who have darker skinned and lighter skinned children. No big deal. So um, evidence number six is ape to man evolution. So this is huge, and I could spend a couple hours on this, but um, the bottom line is there's a huge difference between apes and men. Maybe you've noticed that. Apes are really good at peeling bananas with their feet, but we can go to the moon and back and make computers and such. And so chimpanzees and humans are not practically identically or are radically different. And they used to say that we're genetically nearly identical, 99% identical. Uh, but actually, they weren't very careful. They were selectively choosing bits and pieces of the genome to make that an an analysis. But now, um, when we do more comprehensive analysis of the whole genomes, what we find is chimpanzee and human are very divergent, very, very divergent. Even if we were 99% identical, there's, so, there's three billion letters in our genome. So even 1% variation differences is 30 million letters in the genetic code. 30 million, that makes for a lot of biological information. But now it looks like the amount of difference is tenfold higher, at least. And so now it's 30, 30, 300 million differences between the genomes. Obviously, we do share things with monkeys. Uh, there, we have share uh, an erect posture. Actually, they're not erect, but we share um, hair, and we share hair the same type of ears and eyes. So, uh, so yes, we're similar to other created being kinds, but we are. There's no way to mutate a chimp into a human. There's no way to create all the information that makes us unique, not even close. Um, so here's the, uh, this afternoon I'll be presenting on contested bones. So after years of doing research on the impossibility of mutating an ape-like creature into man, we, we would get responses like, well, you're obviously wrong because look at the fossil record. And so uh, Chris Roop and I spent, mostly Chris did almost all the research. It was the equivalent of a PhD thesis in terms of the depth of his study of all the original papers. And um, five years of research, um, it was, um, and it's a very thick book. And our conclusions are like, we were hoping that we could, you know, maybe show there were some dings and dents and gaps in them, their model. The whole uh, hominin fossil claims, the whole collection of bones that are considered intermediate between ape and human, totally comes undone in our analysis. Totally comes undone. There's two groups that are of interest. The first group is uh, Australopithecus which would include Lucy and other variants of uh, that ape-like creature. And um, the name Australopithecus means southern ape. And we say yes. We say yes to Australopithecus. And then we have over here human beings who have undergone genetic entropy, 
we're going to talk about genetic entropy next, but basically uh, we're all getting more mutant. We, and so over time, uh, our, uh, our fitness declines. In small isolated groups, you get inbreeding and that accelerates this downward spin. So you have Australopithecus southern ape, then we have Homo sapiens, which is humans, including humans that have pathologies because of genetic entropy, there's pathology. All the early human bones that they consider pre-human show pathology. They tend to be small, they are diseased, they have really major uh, anomalies in their bones, and they clearly rep represent genetically damaged people in these small isolated tribes. And so, um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a good read. Um, you, ha you need some time to read it, but it's very thorough and very compelling. And so praise God that God gave us all that evidence. So genetic entropy is the last evidence. I spoke about it uh, earlier today. Um, there is compelling evidence that all, all forms of life must degenerate over time. And that basically, uh, it's not evolution upwards, it's de-evolution downwards. And we, we document this on many levels. And so if, it's, if, if, if mutations drive things down, because mutations are typographical errors in the instruction manuals of life, obviously most mutations are going to be, almost all, will be deleterious. The few that are good will be drowned out by the bad. And so there's compelling evidence that things should be going down, and then we show biological evidence that, that affirms that. So if it's going down, not up, you can't go from ape to man because we're a whole lot smarter and we have a soul. By the way, there's no soul gene. It's something above and beyond your body. There's no soul mutation. <laughs> you don't get a soul by mutation and selection. It can only be imparted by God. So this is really cool. Uh, it basically shows, and I've shown, some of you have seen this, but it's worth seeing over and over again, really, is the Bible has data on the age of the patriarchs, how old they were when they died. And there's a clear pattern. And so that pattern shows systematic degeneration, which is for, for which we have compelling evidence that there should be. We did our genetic entropy, I did genetic entropy research for several years with numerical simulations showing this biological decay curve, this type of curve where, where fitness starts high and declines over time. And um, I, was, I was happy because it was showing that evolution is not true. But then when I looked in the Bible and I saw these, this data, which other people had discovered too, I saw that data shows the same genetic decline that my numerical simulations show. And so, and I realized my, the book, Genetic Entropy, not only shows that evolution is impossible, it powerfully affirms scripture which is since the fall, all things are decaying and degenerating. So Noah lived to be 950, poor Shem only had 600 years, Abraham 175, King David died of old age at 70, and the average uh, Roman citizen only expect, had an average expectancy of 45 years. That would be about the time of Jesus. So um, clear evidence in the Bible, scientific evidence in the Bible, that shows that it's down, not up. So you can't get a monkey to a man no matter how much time you have. It's not a matter of time because the monkey degeneration is degenerating even as a human is. And so you could say, well, in a billion years, maybe we can get a monkey to a man. No, in a billion years, both monkey and man will be extinct or more realistically, Christ will come before that. So restoring Adam and Eve... This talk is, believe it or not, not focused on science. This talk is for believers who have been discouraged in their faith by these claims that are false. And so my job as a scientist and an apologist is to roll those boulders, those stumbling stones out of your path so that you can believe more fully. Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. 
They were fearfully and wonderfully made. I tried to communicate just how wonderfully made they are. Uh, they were fallen. They have been redeemed. And they are that, and that is our own place. That is our, where we are at. Is all wonderfully made, fallen and redeemed. Hallelujah. Amen. That's all. Thanks for listening. <laughs>